This is how to build cost-competitive AI solutions to land your first five clients. Watch closely because this is how successful AI agencies are differentiating themselves from competitors. The influx of AI agencies and freelancers has been insane in 2025 and building AI solution that works is now the bare minimum. The best AI solutions are not just reliable, but cheap to run. And in this video, I'll walk you through how you can build them with just a few simple tweaks to your any landing workflows. You may be able to build all sorts of workflows and have thousands of them in your directory. But if you don't know how to make them scalable and affordable in production, no client is ever going to buy it. Which is why knowing the fundamentals of why and how to build modular AI agent architecture is crucial. The first mistake that I see beginners make is passing complex prompt to AI. Because they have been told that the more detailed and sophisticated the the problem is the better. In reality, that is like asking the model to solve a very difficult math problem entirely in its head in a single step. Ideally, what you want to do is break it down into simpler steps with each focus on a specific problem. I'm going to show you how this looks like in practice and don't worry, I'll show you in a second why this saves you significant costs. This is one example of a complex prompt involving multiple instructions for an AI agent that handles the entire process of copywriting. It's brittle, hard to test, and unreliable. Instead, break it down into separate blocks. This way, we have four separate agents, each with their own focused tasks. So the question is, how does this save costs? Model switching means taking advantage of the modular AI agent architecture and assigning different LLMs based on the type of task or input. This is the most effective yet understated lever that you can pull because the cost difference is massive over time. Just by switching to a model that is a tier below, you shave off 80% of cost instantly. And a modular AI agent architecture gives us ample opportunity for it to do just that. Task-dependent model switching means assigning cheaper or more expensive LLMs based on the complexity of the task. And this is only possible when we have a modular AI agent architecture. In the contrary, monolithic AI agents with complex problems lock you into expensive AI models. Models. Next, we have input-dependent model switching, which involves dynamically categorizing your input data to be processed by different LLMs. This is how it looks like in practice. All right, so I have two example use cases here in which model switching can really come in handy. So the first one here is essentially just a normal chat session with the AI agent, as you can see here. Um, so we have the chat window, and then we have a basic LLM chain node that would then categorize the complexity of the question. For example, if a card question is being passed into the AI agent, then this will evaluate it as a hard question. And then we'll set the LLM accordingly. So you can see here, if I open this set node, we'll see that if the complexity has been evaluated as high, we'll be using the Opus model. And if it's medium, we'll use Sonnet 4. And then if it's low, we will be using 3.5 Haiku, which is the cheapest model. Um, the same, you can do the same thing with open AI models as well. For example, in this case, if the complexity is high, you can use GPT-5. If it's medium, you can use mini. And if it's low, we can use nano. And of course, this is not necessarily like, you can always do high as GPT-5 and then medium can be mini and then low can be mini as well. So it really depends on how you want to play around with these models. And this is just a very simple scenario where you can use model switching because there's a lot of AI agent chat applications in which customers will normally just ask very simple questions. But then we have set one fixed model like a GPT-5 to answer these questions and so the output tokens will be very expensive and so if you can kind of like dynamically set these LLMs based on the question then in the long run this can become very cost efficient now the second example use case here is something that you would usually see more often what I've done here is I created some mock data and so if I just run this you'll see that I have a bunch of questions and then for each question, I have a complexity as well. Now in real life, you'll probably get some data from some API and then you will use something like this basic LLM chain that will then go ahead and categorize each input data and then get their complexity. And if you just open up this system message, you'll see that this is essentially what I did. Uh, I said, hey, this is the characteristics of low complexity. Um, these are the characteristics for medium and then high complexity. And then I'll just get LLM to go through each question or data and then just evaluate them like that. So once, once I've done that, we have this data now and then we'll set the model based on the complexity of the data that we have. Uh, same thing at like above, if it's high, you can set it to Opus, Medium, Sonnet, etc. And then we can merge and sort them. Um, and then this is where the conditional logic happens. So if it's an easy question, we say that we'll get a high cool, right? Because if you look back here, we say that if this is an easy question, we we'll use 3.5 high cool. And so if you come here, you'll see that in the switch node, we have if JSON model is equals to high cool, then we we'll go on the high cool path. Uh, the same goes for Sonnet 4 and Opus 4.1. 4 
So you can set, so in this node, you can effectively set as many paths as you want by just clicking add routing rule. And then you can set as, model, as many models as you want as well. And then, so let's say if this is Haiku, and so let me just run this and you'll see what I mean. So if I run this, you'll see that now we have two items that will go into the Haiku path, five in Sonnet, and then we have three that goes to Opus. And so in, in this sense, we are already saving some money because if we have set just going to Opus, then we would have seven additional items that would have been going into the Opus route, which could have otherwise been just be a Haiku or Sonnet level kind of question. And then subsequently, you'll see that we have three different AI agents here. And then each AI agent essentially have different models. So for this easy input agent, we have Haiku. And then for the harder one, we have Sonnet 4. And then for the hardest one, we have Opus 4.1. And so what happens is you then go ahead and run these three agents and then at the end we can just merge and append all the answers together for each of the questions. Now if you just bring them all together for both input dependent model switching as well as task dependent model switching, you can see that the first part of what we've done here is essentially input dependent model switching because we're saying if this is an easy kind of input then uh, just use a low cost LLM to process it whereas if it's a very hard or difficult input one that requires more reasoning then we'll pass it to something like an Opus 4.1 to help us answer the question uh, and then subsequently you'll see in this section here which is task dependent model switching and essentially what I've done here is I just wanted to give you an example of how you can chain your workflow um, in a modular way which would then allow you to take advantage of cheaper models so if, for example, if you have an AI agent that just does something easy, then similarly, you can use a Haiku model. And then if it does something hard, then you can use a Opus 4.1. Or if you want, you can use like GPT as well. So for example, if you want to use for this is a hard one, right? So we use GPT Nano. Sorry, this is an easy one, right? So we use GPT-5 Nano. And then we'll change the name here as well. GPT-5 Nano. And then for the hard one is um, you can use GPT-5. And this is a way better approach compared to if you just had one, you know, one AI agent which combines both of these different tasks into a single agent like that. And then what happens is you have no choice because now you have a hard task and an easy task. And so you have to use the more expensive model, which is the GPT-5 model, if you want to handle both in a single agent. And one more thing that I wanted to walk you through is also the, the set note here. So let's just take a closer look at what is actually going on in this expression. So we have json.complexity and essentially what, what is what is doing here is if we just run this, um, you'll see that json complexity is essentially each of these values here, which is low, medium, high, etc. And so we're saying if json.complexity and json, dollar sign json just means whatever output that is coming from uh, one node right before it, which is in our case, create mock data. So if JSON complexity equal equal equals to high, then we'll set this model, right? So the question mark here is just me just means if condition, which is JSON dot complexity is high, then it will assign this, right? And then the colon here just says else, which means like if JSON complexity is high, we will assign cloud opus or else, then we will have another if node, which, which would then just say, if JSON complexity is medium, then we'll assign Sonnet, and then else, we will use Haiku, which is the last condition. I think an easier way to kind of like, for you to visualize this is, if complexity is equals to high, then we would say we assign model is equals to this, right? And then, if not, if not, then you can say if complexity is equals equals to medium, then we'll say the model is equals to sonnet 4. And then else or else and then and then or else the model will be equals to haiku. Right, so in plain English, this is essentially what this expression here is doing. The best part about having modular AI agents is that now you can have greater visibility of token cost at each step. This gives you the opportunity to continuously monitor, identify areas of improvements, and increase the conciseness of your prompt, which would all help to reduce the overall cost of your AI workflows. All right, so that's the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. Next week, I'll be talking all about sub workflows and how you can use them to build polished AI solutions 
to impress your clients. In my channel, I focus on covering tutorial that aims to help you master building AI workflows, not just copying templates. So if you like this video, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and also turn on the notification bell so that you'll be notified when the next video gets released. Meanwhile, feel free to check out this video if you want to learn more about ways you can reduce your AI automation workflow costs, or this video where I teach you the fundamentals of building any AI automation workflows perfect if you are just starting out. That's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. Let me know in the comments what you would like to see next from me. Thanks for watching. Bye.